the book of Ezekiel in chapter 5. And I think we'll read verses 8 through 17 tonight. We'll be, in this section, we'll be dealing with most of these verses. Verse 8, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against thee, and will execute judgments in the midst of thee, in the sight of of the nations. And I will do in thee that which I have not done, and whereunto I will not do any more the like, because of all thine abominations. Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of, of thee will I scatter into all the winds. Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall mine eyes spare, neither will I have any pity. A third part of thee shall die with the pestilence and with famine, shall they be consumed in the midst of thee, and a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee, and I will scatter a third part into all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. Thus shall mine anger be accomplished, and I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be comforted, and they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal, when I have accomplished my fury in them. Moreover, I will make thee waste and a reproach among the nations that are round about thee in the sight of all that pass by. So it shall be a reproach and a taunt and instruction and an astonishment unto the nations that are round about thee when I shall execute judgments in thee in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes I, the Lord, have spoken it. When I shall send upon them the evil arrows of famine, which shall be for their destruction, and which I will send to destroy you, and I will increase the famine upon you, and will break your staff of bread. So will I send upon you famine and evil beasts, and they shall bereave thee, and pestilence and blood shall pass through thee, and I will bring the sword upon thee, how the Lord have spoken it. Last week we concluded the first point under Jerusalem's punishment. And that is the fact that this punishment that is meted out to Jerusalem is at the hand of God. It's the hand of God. It would appear to us that it was at the hand of the Chaldeans, the Babylonian army, Nebuchadnezzar. It would appear to us that it was an invading country. But they are God's emissaries. God calls them his servant to mete out his judgment and his justice. And we concluded the thought on that point is that God has created all things. Not anything that was created that was not created by God. And therefore, and get this, children, because it goes along with Sunday school lesson, Sunday, he can use anything he wants. And he can do with it whatever he wishes and desires. Sunday school lesson this Sunday will be about Joshua asking the Lord to cause the sun to stand still. And it went, did not go down. And he's the creator. 
He can do that. He can use it. He, cre he created the Babylonian army. He gave them their great power and, and their dominion. And he can use them against his people if he so desires. Tonight we begin to look at, and I think we'll conclude with the second point, at least get that far. The second point under Jerusalem's punishment is that this punishment comes from what? Just because God is wanting to be mean? And just to display a mean streak? Is that why? There's nobody here like that, right? <laughs> just sometimes we just got to let go, you know, and, and we restrain ourselves, but we show it in other ways. <laughs> I won't tell you the story. No. God lets us know, and He let Judah and Israel know that this punishment that was being meted out to them was because of His sore displeasure. Because they, they had been so sinful and he had been so long suffering with them and they would not repent and turn and till his anger, his fury, he was even furious with them. Verse 11, which we read tonight, said... Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary, they had polluted it with all thy detestable things, those things with which they polluted it with was detestable in God's eyes. They should have been detestable in Israel's eyes, but were not. And with all thine abominations, they were those those things were an abomination to God. Therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall mine eye spare, neither will my eye have pity on you, neither will I have any pity on you. <laughs> You see, they, they had pushed God to the limit, so to speak. Turn with me to the book of Numbers. Numbers in chapter 11. In verse 1. And it seems to have been the history of Israel. We know their wilderness wanderings. We know, I mean, <laughs> they, they, they weren't hardly out of the land of Egypt. They weren't even across the Red Sea. And they were mur murmuring. The Lord miraculously delivered them across the Red Sea and, and they come to bitter water and what happens? <laughs> Immediately, they start complaining against God. And that was their life. So in chapter 11 of Numbers and verse 1, it says, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord, there is his fury and furiousness, <laughs> and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. <laughs> you see, again, they had pushed him to the point of being angry and furious. 
with them in their sins. He said, I am a jealous God. <laughs> he wants us to worship Him, and, and to worship Him, it has to be in pureness of heart. been many years now I can't recall just when maybe 20 years ago 20, I, got, I got convicted about complaining about the weather too cold, too hot oh we don't want it to rain right now <laughs> and to do so is to sin against God You see, we, we complain, and, we, and many times our complaining is against the providences of God. I don't feel good. Why don't I feel good? Lord, why have you afflicted me so? That's complaining. And to complain against Him. Psalms chapter 2 and I know this is talking more about the heathen than it is God's people but we even looked at passages last week and it's all that God, God's people just because they're God's people don't have a license to to sin and to displease God. And, and he, will, he will deal with us. Chapter 2 of Psalms and verse 5 says, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. And we've just, just seen in Numbers how that he, he was displeased with his people. He called, he called their father, Abraham, out of all the Chaldees. And he blessed him. He graced him. And <laughs> extended promise to him. And began to make of him that great nation. And that great seed. <laughs> he suffered long with them. Abraham. He suffered long with Isaac. He suffered long with Jacob. He suffered long with them when the twelve sons went down into Egypt. And he suffered long with them in Egypt, 430 years in Egypt. He suffers long with us. <laughs> I'm glad he does. I'm glad he does. But don't count that he's going to continue to suffer long with you. The whole point that we need to get is, is there comes an end to his long suffering. Considering, considering the people and who they were, they were his people. They were, he, he loved them. Not because they were better than anyone else. Not because they were more in number than anyone else. But he chose them to put his name there to magnify, to exalt His name. They must have surely sore, sore displeased Him considering that they were that people. 
for him to 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 execute judgment in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes. Did you catch that in verse 15 when we read it? Let me get back to my, my text. Chapter 5 and verse 15. He said, So it shall be a reproach and a taunt and an, an instruction and an astonishment unto the nations that are round about thee when I shall execute judgments in thee in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken it. What's that mean, I, the Lord, have spoken it? And it's going to come to pass. You can count on it. And God doesn't, doesn't, doesn't just speak to hear himself speak like we do sometimes. God, who cannot lie, has spoken. Turn with me to the book of Leviticus. And we read a lengthy passage from there last week. One of those verses that we read, we'll read tonight. Leviticus chapter 26, in verse 28. He said, Then I will walk contrary unto you. That is, in their if they'll be disobedient, if they won't be obedient, but if they be disobedient, then he will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Boy, he, he must be furious. That is a hot anger. That is a burning anger against his people for their disobedience. Take heed, brothers and sisters. Take heed, brothers and sisters. He had been long-suffering, but no more. Verse 13, he said, Mine anger That which has been for a long time. <laughs> He's been angry. He's been displeased with him for a long time. You think about it. I was reading this morning. Since David... There was not a king to set upon the throne of David since David, whose heart was perfect, with the Lord. Not even Solomon. <laughs> Solomon was for a while, but he had a weakness. <laughs> And his weakness was what God had forbid the nation of Israel to do. And that is to take wives of the other lands. And he didn't just do it once. He took 700 wives and gathered him 300 concubines. I can't even begin to imagine it. Sometimes it's all I can do trying to please one. Let alone 700? And 300 others? Whew. And you know what? The very thing happened that God said would happen. You children getting this? Yeah, I know it's a long ways away, but it'll be here qu quicker than you think. They turned his heart from serving God. 
and they turn it to idolatry. And there were some good kings in Judah who did right as far as they went, but none could be said they, their heart was perfect as was David's heart with the Lord. Psalms chapter 86. Eighty six and verse fifteen. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. And you think of that long span of time from David until the time they were carried away into the Babylonian captivity. That's a long span of time, and God was long suffering with them. to this point that we are in Ezekiel. <laughs> but he'd come to the end of his long suffering. And shall now, he said, be accomplished and I will cause my fury to rest upon them. That doesn't mean his fury is going to come to a conclusion. That means his fury is going to settle right in on him. And for a long time. And, and ever since that Babylonian captivity, yes, his fury has been on. Yes, there was a couple spells where Remnant was allowed to go back to the land and partial restoration and rebuilt the temple and, and, and everything. But, but then finally in in 100 A.D.? 70 A.D. <laughs> it was destroyed by the Roman Empire. and hadn't been rebuilt. That was over 2,000 uh, years ago. Has his fury settled in upon them? <laughs> he said, it shall rest upon them. It shall settle down and remain there. They brought it on themselves. And you and I bring it on ourselves. How? Through our disobedience, which he equates with unbelief. Read the book of Hebrews, particularly chapter 3 and chapter 4. And he references Moses and Aaron, and in their disobedience, he accounted it to them back in, in the book of uh, Exodus as unbelief, or Deuteronomy as unbelief. And he said, and I will be comforted. In other words, when my vengeance has gone out, and I get my vengeance, my revenge, he'll be satisfied. He'll be satisfied. <laughs> One day he's going to be satisfied. When will that be? <laughs> well, we're we're coming. Well, I don't know whether we'll get get to it in Ezekiel or not. It's there in Ezekiel, the latter chapters, millennial reign of Christ. I was reading some brethren, and they're trying to do a survey, wanting to know. Who, what they thought about uh, what books were 
easier and more difficult to preach from and, and uh, the major prophets come up, which is what we're in. Ezekiel is a major prophet. And something was said about Ezekiel and, and one fellow said, well, I got uh, um, some different takes on it. He said, of course, maybe if I, uh, and he was talking about the last chapters there. The temple is described in those last chapters in, in the city and so forth. And, and uh, you're way off base. You're way off base. And he said, but he made this, com he did make this comment. He said, maybe if I preached through the book of Ezekiel, I would come to a different conclusion. And, and I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay, he hasn't preached through Ezekiel. So he's just, he's just looking at it through a glass darkly right now. And he hadn't even started to dig into it. So, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <coughs> His justice is going to be satisfied. His purpose is going to be accomplished. And the remnant, and we've got more to say on the remnant. The remnant's in this chapter. It's again in chapter 6. we we got more to say on the remnant. The remnant is, is, is going to be his satisfaction. You see, and, and, and he will deliver them. And, and, of course, the whole world comes to do battle against, against Israel, the elect of Israel, that remnant, and God, Jesus Christ. And, and he's going to overthrow them in the battle of Armageddon and establish his millennial reign. Our sins, our sins grieve him. Did you know that our sins grieve him? They grieve him. They anger him. Uh, Psalms chapter 95. In, in verse 10, and that's what, what these judgments are against against Israel, uh, Judah and Israel that Ezekiel is, is to, to proclaim. Is that their sins have, have grieved and, and angered the Holy One, the Righteous One, the Just One. <laughs> Psalms chapter 95 and, and, and verse, verse 10. We read, He that chastiseth the heathen shall not he correct he that teacheth man knowledge shall not he know are, are you in 95? oh I read 94 sorry but, but I like that verse 10 and 94 too that, I mean he, he, he's going to the thought there is he chastiseth the heathen well, shall he not correct you And me, chapter 95, verse 10. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation. Why was he grieved with them? Because of their disobedience. Well, they did, all they did most of the time was just complained it, wasn't it? That's disobedience. That's unbelief. That's not trusting God. And said, it is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. <laughs> I mean, we say, we look at him, we say, how can they not know his ways? I mean, he was performing his ways right there in front of them. Well, he's given you and me. This. And he performs his ways right in front of our eyes. He supplies for us. He feeds us. And yet we're disobedient. We act in unbelief.
chapter 78. Seventy-eight and verse forty. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? That chapter deals with their wilderness wanderings and talking about their 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 the things that they grieved him with. But then you can read when they were into the land. When they had taken the land and were in the land, settled in the land, and the ways in which they grieved him. Look at Ephesians. Chapter 4. Verse 30. Verse 29. <laughs> I mean, I mean he, uh, from, from about uh, verse eight, 18, he said, uh, verse 17, he, he starts talking about, about that we should not, we as God's people, and particularly as members of God's uh, body, of his church, should not live as, a, as the heathen do, as the unsaved do. And we should not do as they we've not so learned Christ that way. And then he talks about our, our communication and, and let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to, to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And then verse 30 it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby he is sealed until the day of redemption. And so when we when we walk in the manners in which he's described and not in unity and, and portraying the body of Christ as we ought to portray the body of Christ, we're grieving God. You say, well, that says Holy Spirit. Well, who is the Holy Spirit? It's God. <laughs> James, <clears throat> the book of James, in chapter 5, verse 9, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Why would we be condemned? Because God's not pleased with it. What happens? We grieve him. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. <laughs> you see, it gets right down to our behavior with one another. Divine compassion, God's compassion defers the judgment. It's, it's long suffering. But there comes judgment without mercy. In other words, He's only going to let us go so long. And we, we refuse to be corrected. We refuse to repent, as did Israel. He'll deal with us without mercy. He'll deal with us in wrath, without pity. That's what he said in verse 11 of our text. said, because of their detestable things and their abominable things, therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall mine eye spare thee, neither will I have any pity. He's not going to be compassionate and merciful. 
to him any longer. Lamentations. Back a book. Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 21. The young and the old lie on the ground in the streets. My virgins and my young men are fallen by the sword. Thou hast slain them in the day of thine anger. Thou hast killed and not pitied. <laughs> you see, Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah, he was, he was prophesying this doom as well. As Ezekiel was to prophesy. Now in, Lam in Lam the book of Lamentations, he's looking upon the destruction that was leveled against them. In the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 11. Look with me at verse 6. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord, but lo, I will deliver the men, every one, into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king, and they shall smite the land, and out of their hand I will not deliver them. You see, there's a time when his long suffering comes to an end. That should serve as a warning to you and I. It should serve to you and I that if we're disobedient, if we're acting in unbelief, we ought to repent. But it also should serve to you and I to be diligent about our service, to be diligent in proclaiming the message of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith, the good news of Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. And it is, the, the, the subject is, is, well, all things continue as they have since the beginning. And, and we've heard that the Lord's coming, but he, he, he has been all this time and he hadn't come yet. Well, don't you fall into that. Amen. But in some ways we do, don't we? We go ahead and we make our plans for tomorrow and for next week and for next month and for next year and... And, yeah, we've, we've heard it. We've heard it all our life. The Lord's coming again. But we don't think he's coming today or tomorrow or next month. But he is coming. Amen. And it may be before we leave this place tonight. But is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. <laughs> Thank God he was long suffering to me. Thank God he was long suffering to you. And just the fact that he hadn't come again says that there's some more out there that he's being long suffering with. Verse 15 says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Why was he long suffering with Israel? He gave them space to repent. He gave them space to, to repent of their wrongdoing, to repent of their unbelief, to repent of their disobedience and get right with him. He gives you and I space to repent. And be right with him. Just think about that. Do you want, do you want, do I want the Lord to come in the midst of my disobedience? In the midst of my unbelief to him? Oh, how sad for him to come. And I not be found walking faithfully, steadfast with him. 
Verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in, in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. He's not talking about falling from grace, but he's talking about us being disobedient, unbelieving, and, and fall from being steadfast and looking for his coming. but grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and ever, forever. Amen. Shall we stand, be dismissed in a word of prayer.